Um, okay, and while we're waiting for that, uh, let's move on to our penultimate presenter, uh, Kufiri Ibong. Uh, Kufri is an embedded firmware developer with core competencies in C and Python programming. He's the co-founder and CTO of Fuel Intellisense in Nigeria Limited, or Niger Fuel Intellisense Nigeria Limited. He's passionate about solving problems using embedded technology in the Internet of Things, uh, and he's been developing firmware running on uh, at Mega Eight, oh, at Mega Three Two Eight STM. 32, GD32, ESP32, etc. for power monitoring and control, IoT displays, sensor data, uh, and he's worked with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, te Bluetooth technologies. And the title of this talk is Building Embedded Web, web Servers Using Ethernet, an alternative to using LCDs. Um, intriguing. So uh, let's take this away. Hello. My name is Kofi Bong, and I'm an embedded firmware developer. I've been writing firmware for over five years now, and I founded a startup in Nigeria, Fuel Intelligence. Uh, so that's a fuel management system that uses IoT to track sales and log fuel inventory to cloud servers so that filling station owners can have an overview of what's happening in their filling stations across the country or across the world. I now work for the best pizza company in the world, Uni UK Limited, based in Scotland. So I'm here to give a short talk and demonstration on embedded web servers and what you need to know to build a simple embedded web server. I'll be breaking down this presentation into three parts. The first part will be a short presentation about the theory, the concepts, network protocols, and all that. The second part is going to be how to set up a basic project using an STM32 um, F4 series board, which has an onboard Ethernet. And then I'll do a demo of the working project. So this talk is broken down into different sessions. So we have the um, uh, talk about the executive summary. We'll talk about network stack, we'll talk about HTTP protocol, which is one of the most widely used protocol application protocols uh, for web servers. We'll talk about the project and then next steps and then the materials where I use to be able to understand concept of embedded web servers. The world is fast becoming a global village. Almost every computer is linked to the internet. It's quite interesting to know that even computers across different continents are physically linked via submarine cables. Some of them use optic fiber technology. So that's interesting. Uh, embedded computers have gradually made their way into that space due to the need for monitoring and data logging um, embedded uh, small embedded devices have you know are playing a major role in the internet these days so different protocols and architectures are required to have a computer run on the internet on the network and we're going to discuss some of those protocols in our talk so the protocols are arranged in stacks and these stacks are basically software layers that abstract each level from the upper layer uh, from the lower layer so that um, the consumer of the upper layer doesn't have to pay attention to the lower level details so we'll talk about the network stack so a network is basically two or more computers that are linked together and the physical interface that links these computers together can either be wired or wireless. Uh, a router is a device that is used to route or transmit link traffic between computers in the network via a set of rules we know as network protocols, which we would discuss in this talk. <clears throat> Excuse me. So basically, we have 
network models and the most commonly known uh, the very full complete stack is called the osi module where osi stands for open system integration model and this defines how data is transferred in a network from one computer to another so basically in this model um like i explained earlier there are different layers that handle play specific roles in the whole system so we have the topmost layer which is the application layer and the application layer is used by network applications such as browsers file transfer apps emailing apps and all that so basically this is the layer that a user like a person interfaces with directly it's very high level so the next layer after the application layer is called the presentation layer so the presentation layer receives data from the application layer and converts it to machine understandable formats this is called translation and it also compresses this data uh reduce that that is reduces the number of bits that's required you know for um um so that he sort of like trans transmits this data more quickly and with less resources and it's also responsible for data encryption and decryption so the next layer is the session layer which manage manages sessions here so it's responsible for authenticating any computer in the network and also um, seeing if that computer is authorized to access a certain resource which it's requesting for so a, re a web browser actually provides these um, top three functions that's the application layer the presentation layer and the session layer this is well handled by the web browser so the next layer is called the transport layer and this controls the reliability of communication and it does this through what's called segmentation so in segmentation, the data is divided into small data units called segments. And each segment has a port and a segment number for the source and the destination, right? So the, the port number helps uh, either the source or the destination when it's, uh, yeah, it helps know, you know, the correct application to send a particular sec data segment to while the sequence number helps either the um, source or the destination to reassemble the data segment when it gets to that point. The transport layer is also responsible for flow control. And this means it controls the, the bit rate, the transfer rate of the data. And for instance, if the sender is sending at a higher rate, it tells the receiver um, if it's set, if the sender is sending at a higher rate, uh, this layer would let it know the appropriate transmission rates, for instance, maybe 50 megabits per second or something. And also if it's sending at a lower bit than that, it, it tries to regulate this by, you know, flow control mechanisms. It also does error control. So it adds, it adds a checksum to every data that is being sent. And so with this checksum, it's able to determine if the data sent has been corrupted and, and thus contains an error. So, it, and this, this is done using automatic repeat requests. And this is how, if a data has error, it uses this to retransmit that data. And the particular stack, the particular um, model that does this is called the TCP transmission control protocol. So, how the TCP um, provides feedback about data that is being transferred. And so it lets, for instance, the sender know that this data, which it sent has been received, it ensures it guarantees the transmission of data. Now this makes it a bit slower than the other protocol, which is called UDP, um, user datagram protocol. And um, this doesn't really give feedback on if the data transferred was successful or not, delivered or not. Hence, it's relatively faster, but prone to lots of errors. So yeah, it's used in places where you're not really concerned about losing any data. So such as videos, transmission, voice transmission, but TCP is used where the reliability and the, the you know, assurance of data transmission is highly needed 
Uh, so imagine you're sending an email, you don't want any of the packets to get missing. And it's also used widely in the World Wide Web. So the next layer is the network layer. The network layer receives the data segments from transport layer and transmits this data segment to the destination computer. It is the layer where the router resides. And the router is responsible for logical addressing. And logical addressing has to do with assigning of a specific IP address, which is like a unique number to every computer in the network. And then um, it uses what's called a mask. Um, usually when you're configuring a router, you see something like the subnet mask. This mask is used to um, tell the system which part of this address is the host network and which part of the address is the computer itself. The network layer is also responsible for routing data um, that's connecting one computer to another in the whole network. And it also determines the best possible path for data to get from one place to another, the shorter, the quickest, and the most, you know, the, the best in, in that light. So the next layer is the data link layer. And the data link layer receives the packets containing the IP address and the data segments from the network layer. Don't forget the network layer adds the IP address to the, um, um, to the packets and then sends it to the data link layer. So this data link layer, it serves to allow the upper layers of the OC model to access the media using techniques such as framing. And framing is where it gets to add the MAC address of the sender and the receiver to each data packet. And, and it forms this forms a frame. And this is where physical addressing is all is, is done remember in the other um, layer that we just talked about the network layer logical addressing is done there logical addressing has to do with assigning ip addresses however here physical addressing is done yeah so it also controls how data is placed and received by the media using media access control and error detection so the last layer we have is called the physical layer and the physical layer, the media is usually a physical link between two or more computers in the network. So this physical layer converts the bits um, to signals for transmission. And these signals could be light, as in optical fiber, which is very fast. I mean, uh, this data travels at the speed of light, and light can travel around the Earth about eight times in one second. So you can imagine how fast these speeds are. Now, oh, remember, all these layers are just software stacks. Now, we have the TCP IP um, model. So, the TCP IP model is basically the OC model, but with, it's stripped of some layers. For instance, the um, uh, in the link layer, it's a combination of both the physical and the data link layer. It's combined to have the link layer. And then we have the network layer. And then we have the transport layer, but then uh, there's no session and presentation letter um, layer. Sorry, all that is handled in the application layer in a way. Now we have the L lightweight IP. So the LWIP stands for lightweight TCP IP stack. Now this is mostly designed um, for embedded systems. Embedded systems, as you know, have reduced resource uh, resources. They have very low RAM and low ROM in the order of kilobits, kilobytes. And so the LWIP stack was made to run on such microprocessors, which may or may not have an operating system, but still allow them to be able to um, host um, um, web servers. Remember, without these protocols, it's impossible for a computer to be able to connect and communicate in a network so we'll talk a little bit about the protocols and the one we pay most most attention to is the http protocol so http stands for hypertext transfer protocol and it's an application layer protocol that sits above the tcp mostly that's the transport layer and it uses a client server model 
So it was initially designed for HTML documents, uh, but of course, as developments and improvements came in, one is now able to send things like um, images, um, videos, and audio files, and several other file formats. So basically, HTTP defines a set of rules that govern how each computer talk, talk to themselves in a network. Uh, so how, how it works is we have web clients and we have web servers. So the clients make requests to the servers. So they could request for files, for pages, or for media like images and videos. And the servers have these things stored in maybe their, their hard disk or their flash memory as in the case of our embedded systems or in a just in a hardware in a hard drive somewhere and when these clients request following a specific set of rules which is the http protocol um, it receives a response from the server yeah so each request would have a start line a header and a body so here we have um, an example of an HTTP request. So here, here's the start line, the request line. It has a method. Here the method specifies the command. So here uh, the methods we have, we have get. And then get sort of like um, specifies or uh, this tells the server to that it wants to get data and information from it. And we have other method, methods such as post, which will tell the server to store a particular data in its database. So we have the target in the same in the start line. We have the target and then we have the HTTP version. After that, we have what's called the request header, which contains any information that you would like to add, such as the um, meme M I M E format, um, the hosts, the language and ETC, and then it has the body. So when a request is made by the web clients, in this case, the web clients were using to illustrate is a web browser. It sends it to the web server. The web server would process, would pass this request. Um, of course, it would go through all the layers that we talked about in the previous slides and then passes the request and sends what is required, sends a response. So the response also has a header. However, in this case, the header of the response doesn't have the method. It just has the um, HTTP version and the response status code and the, the status message. So we have different status codes. There's um, status codes that start with 100, uh, those are like informational status codes. There's 200, which means success, 300, which means redirection to another website, 400, which means client's error codes, 404 me meaning that all oh, the page that the client is requesting for is not found. And then 500 means, oh, the server is having issues. Could be that the server is down or something, something like that. So HTTP is connectionless. It's a connectionless protocol. What that means is that after a request has been made by a client and then the server receives it, the client would disconnect from the server. And then when the response is ready, another connection has to be initiated for that response to get to the client. So it's connectionless. It doesn't maintain its connection. Um, HTTP is also stateless. That means that when two computers have connected before and they disconnect, they would have to connect again and start from the beginning to establish you know all these rules and that is needed for the connection http can deliver any sort of data can deliver html files text files um and so on like i mentioned before uh, basically http uses what's called uri universal resource identifiers which is a set of characters that is used to locate a particular resource in the web server. So there are um, quite a number of client and server languages. Uh, we have um, HTML, which is not exactly a programming language, but it's, um, it's used to uh, 
present contents on your website. Uh, and we have CSS, Cascaded Style Sheets, which is used to add style and design, you know, to the contents provided by the HTML, like where to place these contents, the colors of the text, the font style, and th different things like that. So we have JavaScript, which is a client-side programming language that's used to develop applications that run on the web clients, um, such as web browsers, mail apps, and etc. etc. Uh, of course, JavaScript has different frameworks, um, Angular, Node, Vue, React, and many other frameworks. Uh, we also have PHP. PHP is a server-side scripting language which is embedded in HTML. So uh, it's basically used in back-end um, web development. It talks, interacts directly with the databases. Um, unlike JavaScript, which is mostly used for front-end web development. So in our, in our project, we're going to basically focus on HTML and just a little bit of CSS to design the, um, the interface. So we'll talk about our project. So we're, we're going to be using an STM32F439ZI microcontroller. Uh, and then we're going to be using the LWIP. The LWIP provides TCP IP layer for embedded systems to enable up the application layer protocols such as HTTP, file transfer protocol, and so on. So they can work on embedded systems. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's minimal, minimized. So most of the full scale features we have in this standard um, OSI 7 layer model, we won't really find them here, but it's just good enough to serve um, an embedded system. So the, the MCU would act like the, the server, would serve things like web pages in our project. Um, it would send data to the web browser, and it's going to do this by using a system called server-side include SSI. So SSI, basically the server would search um, for special HTML files that have file extensions such as .shtml. So it would search them for ash include directives, which I'll show you during the demonstration. And then when it finds these directives, it would include whatsoever um, it's requested for, replace them by those variables, kind of like how preprocessor directives work in, in C programming. Um, so we also have CGI, um, Common Gateway Interface, and then this allows you to be able to, in a, in a nutshell, control the web server, in this case our embedded microcontroller from something like a web browser. Uh, so uh, this project is very basic, it will just show you how to read data from a potential meta on a web server and then also how to use a web server to control a, the onboard LEDs of the microcontroller. Now, however, in the next steps, you could make this project Wi-Fi enabled because at the moment we are doing this via Ethernet. So it, an ESP32 chip can be added to make this project to work with Wi-Fi. And then web sockets can be added to you know eliminate the need for refreshing the browser um because with the method we use ssi um the browser needs to be frequently refreshed in order to get the current values uh, also you could tunnel the data to the internet so that it could be accessed from any part of the world so i'd like to give kudos to some sites i used um, in the development of this project um embedded expert io and someone who was very helpful to me um his name is rene based in the Netherlands, Solid Embedded Systems Engineer. And then of course, um, YouTube, Controllers Tech. Thank you. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them to my email or to reach me on LinkedIn, Kofi Ref Friday Abong, that's my LinkedIn handle. Do send in your questions, send me connect request and I'll be sure to accept them.